thesis panel we've ever had. First thesis panel we've ever had, Adam Ithmoot. Some of these panelists have already done a thesis theater, which you can access through the YouTube channel or through the library archives. Um, and then one panelist is doing this fresh and new for us. So our panel is called Where Imagination Takes Us, Investigations into Literary Traditions Old and New. So I'll just read you the titles of their papers and a little bio of each presenter, and I'll do that for all the presenters now. Each will talk for about 15 minutes, giving you some selection of his or her research. So you're not going to be getting the entire overview of the whole thesis, because what they wrote was of varying lengths, but all longer than conference paper <laughs> length. Um, so you're getting some section, some points. Some, so you know they would love questions about maybe the larger scope of the research, where it's going, what did you want to say that you left out, those sorts of things. Uh, when we do get to the questions, I'd ask that you just keep them like a really short question to the point so we get a chance to answer a lot of them. If you have some longer discussion, have that with them individually, please. All right, so our first presenter today will be Dan Kinney on the relationship between heroism and brokenness in modern fantasy literature. Kat Sass, we are all stories in the end, the place of Doctor Who in the fairy tale tradition. Cynthia Smith, the political philosophy of J.R.R. Tolkien, and Curtis Wayant, literature and praxeology. So Dan says that for his undergraduate degree, he studied English literature at Concordia University in Ann Arbor, Michigan, graduating in 2006, and began studying English language and literature at Signum University in January of 2012, and graduated in 2016. He's currently employed at General Motors and spends his free time studying various subjects and attempting to write. Obviously succeeding since you're reading some of it to us. Kat Sass currently works in academic administration at the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. She earned her BA in English Literature from Messiah College and has re recently completed her master's degree here at Signum, specializing in imaginative literature. She has published essays in More Doctor Who and Philosophy and Harry Potter for Nerds Too, presented papers at previous Myth Moots and the C.S. Lewis and Inkling Society Conference, and participated in several Signum panels on film and TV. She currently blogs about imaginative storytelling in all mediums at Raving Sanity, so check out that blog, and co-hosts a TV podcast on Doctor Who, The Buffyverse and Battlestar Galactica with Curtis called Cat and Kurt's TV Review. And of course, my phone goes off. <laughs> Cynthia Smith. After graduating from BYU, Cynthia received a master's in library science from the University of Arizona. She has just completed her MA here. When she is not working as a librarian in Arizona, she has her nose in a book. And Curtis is a content writer by trade and a student of literature by choice. He co-hosts Cat and Kurt's TV review podcast and occasionally blogs at curtiswayant.com. His writing has appeared in Pop Matters, McSweeney's Internet Tendency, and Joss Whedon, The Complete Companion. All right, so we'll hear first from Dan Kinney. All right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to speak a little quickly because I have a lot to cover, I think. So I'll try to <coughs> be coherent. Um, one of the major elements of fantasy literature is that of the hero. Uh, while the relationship between the reader and the hero of the story is one that forms almost immediately, there is another important relationship that the hero experiences which may not be obvious at first glance. This relationship... Excuse me, Dan, would you be able to use the microphone? I don't want to miss one word. Uh, I can. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to. <laughs> That's true. Is it okay to go? Yes. Is this better? Yes. Okay. All right. Yay. All right. Let's start again. Okay. One of the major elements of fantasy literature is that of the hero. While the relationship between the reader and the hero of a story is one that forms almost immediately, there is another important relationship that the hero experiences which may not be obvious at first glance. This relationship, which can sometimes be hard to see, relates directly to each hero's past and to their future choices. The relationship that I'm speaking of is that between heroism and brokenness. Now it's well known that the state of fantasy literature in the modern academic community is shaky. Lucy Armit, senior lecturer in the Department of English at the University of Lincoln, states that sudden, quote, suddenly we need to justify our interest in fantasy literature. What we overlook when situating fantasy on the margins of literary creativity is that fantasy is central to all fictional work. Armit's position on this is clear. Those who study fantasy literature are doing so in a realm in which their work is actively looked down upon from a biased institution that has already eradicated the possibility of meaningful interpretation from fantasy literature. 
Jack Zipes, some of you may be familiar with him, uh, Professor Emeritus of German and Comparative Literature at the University of Minnesota, states in an article entitled, quote, Why Fantasy Matters Too Much, that, quote, fantasy mobilizes in, 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 <coughs> excuse me, and instrumentalizes the fantastic to form and celebrate spectacles that exist and have always existed. It is through the fictive projections of our imaginations based on personal experience that we have sought to grasp, explain, alter, and comment on reality. Now, to fully understand the role of the hero in modern fantasy literature, we must find the answer to two questions. One, do we value characters for their heroism because they do not have faults, nor exhibit a type of brokenness? Or two, do we value characters who become heroic despite their shortcomings and their own brokenness? Throughout literary history, heroes have been associated with good, while villains have been associated with evil. However, what we are seeing in modern fantasy literature is that its heroes are being represented less and less as static figures with fixed morality systems. Rather, heroes in modern fantasy literature are much more like readers of current times. These modern heroes are presented as much more morally ambiguous than those of the past, when the role of hero used to stand for perfection or personifications of moral ideals. Now, it is not that the heroes of today's fantasy literature have become more evil, but there has been a detectable rise in the apparent moral ambiguity of all heroes, of these heroes. Authors such as Lev Grossman, Joe Abercrombie, Brandon Sanderson, George R.R. R. Martin, and J.K. Rowling are in introducing heroes who are tarnished with flaws which Western society would deem as morally ambiguous. In his book, Fantasy, the Liberation of Imagination, Richard Matthews, a professor of English at the University of Tampa, suggests examining the role of hero by plotting them against a set of established criteria. He categorizes this approach as horizontal heroes and vertical heroes. He states that, quote, the hero can be measured first against the gods in an infinite and atemporal, atemporal reality, then in the finite and temporal order of history and society, and finally in the uh, in the finite and contained universe of individual consciousness as it comes to know itself, the world, and others. Now this hero chart is a convenient way of tracking the final incarnation or point at which a character becomes a hero, but it tends to track the character's destination instead of their journey. Um, <clears throat> now brokenness as exhibited by the characters in modern fantasy is typically a result of extreme personal problems or trauma experienced at some point in their lives. Faults and shortcomings in a character are not necessarily indications of a character's brokenness, but brokenness can manifest itself in these ways, in addition to others. So it can be a little confusing. Sometimes the origins of brokenness um, in a character will be described clearly and quickly by an author early in the narrative of a character's story. However, there are times when an author will mask or obscure this information, leaving the work or speculation up to the reader in the quest to determine the origins of that character's brokenness. Now there are varying degrees to which an author will reveal this information to the reader, but it will fall someplace within the spectrum of these two methods. For example, I'm gonna sound like a bit of a Patrick Rothfuss fanboy because I realize that most of my examples that I use for this talk are from him, so. That's all right. That's fine, because I am a fanboy. Um, <clears throat> For example, the two methods that Patrick Rothfuss uses to disclose the origins of brokenness in his characters are, in my opinion, the best examples of such in modern fantasy literature. In The Name of the Wind, uh, the reader learns early in the narrative the origins of Quoth's brokenness. Quoth, the protagonist, expresses a desire to go to the university to learn more about sympathy, which is the series' version of magic, um, after he is introduced to its mysteries by a traveling arcanist, or arcanist. Uh, quote, I should make, and this is from Quoth, uh, I should make it clear that much of the time I spent with the arcanist, arcanist was my free time. I was still responsible for my normal duties in the troop, but I didn't bemoan the loss of my free time. A child's endless energy and my own insatiable lust for knowledge made the following year one of the happiest times I can remember. However, Quoth's intentions and motivations for attending the, the university changed dramatically after the moment when he becomes a broken person. After taking a walk through the woods, he returns to his troop's caravan where he discovers that everyone, including his parents, has been murdered savagely in cold blood. The creatures responsible for this are a group of figures called the Chandrian, a, a mythical team of powerful beings held mostly in superstition by people inhabiting his world. Now, his motivations 
turn from furthering his own personal desires and broadening knowledge of sympathy to that of discovering more about the unfamiliar Chandrian and a way to avenge the death of his parents and loved ones. The moment, the moment of Quoth's brokenness is described to the reader early in the book, and reminders and symptoms of it are continually being given to the reader for analysis and inspection. And this is a quote from, um, from the book. This is from Quoth's perspective. In the beginning, I was almost like an automaton, thoughtlessly performing the actions that would keep me alive. I also had one thing I did not need, time. After I had taken care of immediate needs, I found, nothing, I, found I had nothing to do. I think this is when a small part of my mind started to slowly reawaken itself. Now make no mistake, I was not myself. At least I was not the same person I had been a span of days before. Everything I did, I attended to with my whole mind, leaving no part of me free for remembering. Um, and I had another <clears throat> thing I wanted to read that uh, I didn't have time to put in the paper. Probably shouldn't put it in because it's adding time. Um, and this is from another another spot. And he's dictating his story to chronicler who's taking down his story. That's so that's a little context here. Um, the slapping footsteps stopped, and more laughter followed. The sound of ripping cloth. Slipping to the edge of the roof, I looked down to the alley below. I saw several large boys, almost men. They were dressed as I was, rags and dirt. There may have been fire, maybe there may, have, there may have been five, maybe six of them. They moved in and out of the shadows like shadows themselves. Their chests heaved from their run, and I could hear their breath from the roof above. The object of the chase was in the middle of the alley. A young boy, eight years old at the most. One of the older boys was holding him down. The young boy's bare skin shone pale in the moonlight. There was another sound of ripping cloth, and the boy gave a soft cry that ended in a choked sob. The others watched and talked in low, urgent tones with each other, wearing hard, hungry smiles. I'd been chased before at night, several times. I'd been caught, too, months ago. Looking down, I was surprised to find a heavy red roof tile in my hand, ready to throw. Then I paused, looking back to my secret place. I had a rag blanket and half a loaf of bread there. My rainy day money was hidden there, eight iron pennies I had hoarded for when my luck turned, for when my luck turned bad. And most valuable of all, Ben's book. I was safe here. Even if I hit one of them, the rest would be on the roof in two minutes. Then, even if I got away, I wouldn't have anywhere to go. I set down the tile. I went back to what I had become, to what had become my home, and curled myself into the shelter of the niche under, underneath the overhanging roof. I twisted my blanket in my hands and clenched my teeth, trying to shut out the low rumble of conversation punctuated by coarse laughter and quiet, hopeless sobbing from below. Now Quoth gestured for the chronicler to set down his pen and stretch, lacing his fingers together above his head. It's been a long time since I remembered that, he said. If you're eager to find the reason I became the Quoth they tell stories about, you could look there, I suppose. Chronicler's forehead wrinkled. What do you mean, exactly? Quoth paused for a long moment, looking down at his hands. Do you know how many times I've been beaten over the course of my life? Chronicler shook his head. Looking up, Quoth grinned and tossed his shoulders in a nonchalant shrug. Neither do I. You'd think that sort of thing would stick in a person's mind. You'd think I would remember how many bones I've had, bro I've had broken. You'd think I remember the stitches and bandages. He shook his head. I don't. I remember that young boy sobbing in the dark, clear as a bell after all these years. Chronicle frowned. You said yourself that there was nothing you could have done. I could have, he said seriously, and I didn't. I made my choice and I regret it to this day. Bones mend, regret stays with me. So we're basically seeing in that moment, like he's reflecting on, he could have done something to basically where he was in his life when his he was broken, he, but he decided not to. As an effect of just his own brokenness, he decided not to, to act. Um, now, alternately, in the slow regard of silent things, another of his books, it's much shorter. Uh, Rothfuss gives the reader an extremely intimate window into the life of his character, Auri, herself a minor character from his King Keller Chronicle series. In this book, Rothfuss de details a week in Auri's life. The reader knows that Auri is not a, not a typical person. There is something very broken inside of her, and it lies very deep. So deep that Rothfuss barely gives the reader a clue as to its origins. The only information that Rothfuss divulges about Ari in this book is that she was once a student at the university and that there was an incident that affected her in such a way that she took to living in the underthing, a series of connected tunnels and places that lie deep in the ground underneath the university. And here's a quote from it. The damp, tight knot of scapperling, an area in the underthing, did not want her back inside. The black door did. The wide and welcome path to black door, 
stretched before her like a black open mouth. A maw, a maw. Step after step, she forced her way back into scapulating. She did not dare let the door, or let the way to black door out of sight. She did not dare let it behind her, all unseen, unseemly, all unseen. While Rothfuss does not explain forthright to the reader the events that brought on Ari's quirky behavior, it is very clear that something is not quite whole with Ari. However, this is the only version of the character that Rothfuss gives his readers. We are not given a picture of the unbroken Ari, and this is completely intentional on Rothfuss's part. By presenting Ari to the reader in this way, he forces the reader to investigate and gather clues about why Ari exists as she does and why that has taken place. Now, characters do not need to have brokenness in their lives to be considered heroes. The literature of older fantasy literature is clearly indicative of that. But the trend in modern fantasy literature has been to portray heroes that have a brokenness which the reader will be able to identify with. While it may be easy to assume that a character's brokenness would somehow stunt or diminish the hero qualities of a character, the exact opposite is true. Uh, the greater the personal struggles and brokenness of a character, the greater their heroic deeds are when viewed in conjunction uh, against the backdrop of such personal issues and trials. Now, how can we label characters who commit acts of rape, adultery, theft, deception, violence, and murder as heroes? There's a very fine line between heroism and villainy, and much of this determination depends on, on your perspective. Uh, Joseph Campbell states that, quote, by overcoming dark passions, the hero symbolizes our ability to control the irrational savage within us, end quote. The perspective of the reader is the litmus test by which the heroism of a character is tested. Um, there's a couple other things here I'm not going to read a whole lot of because we're out of time. Uh, they're mostly examples and I can, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to read them. But, um, um, let's see here. Yeah, yeah, we're going to go to the conclusion. Um, <coughs> after a character is broken, they face a choice. A choice to follow the path that mirrors the values of high morality or that of its antithesis. However, sometimes characters are not necessarily aware of the nature and implications of their choices. In The Lord of the Rings, the character of Gollum experiences this exact situation. After he has been broken by Sauron's ring of power, Gollum faces a series of choices which have the potential to lead him down two very different paths. And I believe it was Michael Drought in his lecture series, uh, Tolkien in the West, who opened my eyes to this realization. Gollum is not considered the hero of Tolkien's masterwork, but had he made different choices, his status in fantasy literature could have been altered greatly. He could have been one of the great heroes. Uh, he is broken and faces extremely difficult choices which direct him down a certain path, and unfortunately for Gollum, it doesn't end well. Um, once we become aware of the per pervasive presence of the brokenness of the heroes in modern fantasy literature, it's almost impossible to ignore. It is everywhere in the current literary, it, it is everywhere in current literary fantasy. It exists in the Harry Potter novels, it, it, in George R.R. R. Martin's Song of Ice and Fire, Ursula K. Le Guin's Earthsea Cycle, Brandon Sanderson, Stephen R. Donaldson, Joe Abercrombie, Trudy Canavan, V.D. Schwab, I can go on and on. <clears throat> um, and uh, of course, well, I'm, I'm only quoting apparently Patrick Rothfuss today. Um, in his end note to the slow regard of silent things, Patrick Rothfuss writes the following. This isn't, this isn't uh, like his work, it's just his own opinion. The quote is, the truth is I'm fond of Ari. I have a special place in my heart for this strange, sweet, shattered girl. I love her more than just a little, and I think it's because we're both somewhat broken in our own odd ways. More importantly, we're both aware of it. Ari knows she isn't all quite proper true inside, and this makes her feel very much alone. I know how she feels, but that itself is not unusual. I am the author, after all. I'm supposed to know how the character feels. It was not until I started gathering feedback that I realized how common this feeling is. I've had person after person tell me that they empathize with Ari, that they know where she's coming from. Um, and in conclusion, basically, brokenness is the seed out of which the potential for heroism and villainy grows. Once a character experiences an event which causes brokenness, they face a, they face a path forward, a path that leads to either heroism or villainy, and one that is determined by the actions of the character. Modern fantasy is concerned with the path that the protagonist takes. Obviously, nearly all the stories of modern fantasy literature feature a protagonist who chooses to follow the path of the hero, but that's only because these characters choose the path of values that we uphold as a society. It cannot be denied that societies around the world uphold different cultural values, but the role of the hero is familiar to all cultures. There is a symbiotic relationship between society and the heroes that exist within it. In modern fantasy literature, it is at the point of brokenness that path to heroism.
begins. Hello. Oh, that was loud. Sorry. Um, so I'm talking about Doctor Who and fairy tales. Um, and when I saw the uh, title of, you know, the theme of the conference was Invoking Wonder, it was pretty obvious to me the section of my thesis that I should narrow and focus on, um, because talking about uh, fairy tales, what they give to the reader, what they give to the characters, how they work, is very much about invoking wonder. Um, both as a quality that you want to read about in a story and something that you hopefully take with you into your life out of the story if it's done well. So it seems like a good thing to focus on, so that's the specific aspect I'm going to discuss. Um, and I've pretty much just been taking notes of these panels and discussions we've been having and trying to think of ways in which to apply that since you've all been listening to that. This is pretty much the last quarter of you know my thesis. Um, so when Verlin Flieger talked about, you know, pulled out those, those key words of awe and wonder and mystery and curiosity and surprise, I kind of sat back and, you know, wrote them down because for those of you who've, you know, been exposed to Doctor Who, what is it if not a celebration of those very qualities? Um, and both in, again, the way that the characters interact with their world and each other and then the way it works upon the viewer. Um, so I'm going to kind of go through some of those points and try to make connections to, you know, the story as it's presented. Um, so this idea of, of perceiving something extraordinary in the ordinary and vice versa um, is very much evoked by the structure of the fairy tale that you have um, you know, I think nobody really put it better than Tolkien's There and Back Again. That's really the classic structure of a fairy tale. If you start with the mundane and the ordinary, someone um, recognizable that we can kind of see ourselves in, who goes through some sort of portal, you know, have whatever form that takes, into the wider world, into the perilous realm, um, and then returns back again. And it's about the relationship between those two worlds to each other. Um, so with Doctor Who, you have the obvious, you know, portal being the TARDIS that, you know, is a reference to C.S. Lewis. It's bigger on the inside. And then not just the TARDIS itself, but takes you into the realm of fairy, um, which is sort of, in sci-fi terms, is, you know, Doctor Who's pseudoscience version of the fantastic. Um, and then, but it, the relationship works both ways, that the mundane is also seen to be extraordinary in some way. And so that can take, you know, different forms in terms of, um, uh, you know, having an animated universe of objects that come to life and, uh, you know, that those boundaries become porous both ways. Everybody has a handout for Cynthia's. We'll switch and do Tolkien and politics, and then we'll come back and hear some more of the best of Doctor Who. <laughs> right. Are you gonna be able to see this, Cynthia, from up here? Don't watch. Don't watch it. it scares you. <laughs> <laughs> don't watch it. I'll, I'll, I'll holler if I need to. All right, when you're ready. Okay. All right. So my thesis was on the political philosophy of J.R.R. Tolkien. Um, one major part of political science is the study of war because political science is intrinsically related to the use of power and unfortunately war is one of the primary um, projections of that power in this world. So today I want to focus on part of my paper that looks at J.R.R. Tolkien and war. Um, Interestingly enough, Great Britain has a long tradition of the military being in public schools. And this applied to J.R.R. Tolkien as well. He, uh, let's see, in 1908, uh, the military was reorganized and re-emphasized across the United Kingdom. In 1909 and 1910, we know that J.R.R. Tolkien participated in their summer officer training course. Um, he was even a part of the coronation ceremony for 
um, George V as he took the throne in 2011, again as part of the Junior Officer Training Corps. Um, when he went to Oxford, he joined the Oxford version of the Officer Training Corps from 2011 to 2012. Um, he, we're not entirely sure what he got out of these activities, although it would not surprise me if part of it was social, given how social Tolkien liked to be sometimes. Um, we know that he resigned in February 2012, so he must have decided there were more important things going on by that point. Still, Tolkien cannot have had outright objection to all things military by this point because of these activities that we can clearly see in his um, record. Another interesting thing we know is that Tolkien enjoyed debate. And interestingly, one of those debates was, should an international court of arbitration be created to replace war? And Tolkien argued against the motion, arguing against institutionalization and democracy and favoring war. I don't know whether this topic and which and the position was assigned to him or not, but it is interesting that some of his later arguments can be found in some of these, in this early debate, specifically against democracy and institutionalization. Um, then, of course, in July 1914, World War One broke out. Um, and it's interesting what Tolkien wrote to his son Michael in 1941 about this experience, as Michael was experiencing something very similar during World War II. Um, Tolkien says, in those days, chaps joined up or were scorned publicly. It was a nasty cleft to be in, especially for a young man with too much imagination and little personal courage. So this is how Tolkien viewed himself way back in 1914. And the way he viewed the world as well, um, unless you were missing a limb or were obviously blind or something like that, it was expected that he joined up. And there was a lot of pressure for that. Um, and it is true that, yes, Tolkien was technically an orphan, and some of his family relations were strained because of his Catholicism. That was not across the board of his entire family. And, and there was likely pressure from that part of his family he did have relations with to join up. Um, at best, he was able to put off fully joining up because he was finishing his degree at Oxford as long as he at the same time enrolled in the military at the same time in a program that allowed him to do both. And it seems that Tolkien had two minds about this war. Um, there is a friend a letter to his close friend, G.B. Smith, in 1916, that said that the war was just, which is for all the evil of our own side, with a large view, good against evil. And Tolkien um, also wrote to Christopher Wiseman in 1914 about things that he was very concerned about, from self-religion, human love, the duty of patriotism, and a fierce belief in nationalism are of vital importance. He is not, a, of course, a militarist, and more and more convinced a home ruler. So Tolkien loved his country. He was convinced that joining up was the right thing to do in his own way, of course. Um, but when he said country, he meant more the countryside, more than any institution like the greater uh, British Empire. Um, it also seems that World War I produced a crisis for Tolkien. Um, John Garth records in Tolkien in the Great War. Back in Oxford, Tolkien confided in a Catholic professor that the, outwar, that the outbreak of war had come as a profound blow to him, the collapse of all my world, as he later put it. Tolkien had been prone to fits of profound melancholy, even despair, ever since the death of his mother, though he kept them to himself. The new life he had slowly built up since her death was now in peril. Hearing his complaint, however, the Catholic professor responded that this war was no aberration, on the contrary, for the human race 
it was nearly back to normal. This can't have been very comforting to told me, even if it was true. <laughs> that war was really just business back to normal. Later, also, Tolkien wrote to Michael during World War II with regards to his own experience of World War I that I was pitched into it all just when I was full of stuff to write and things to learn and never picked it up again. So interestingly, Tolkien felt that there were things that the war interrupted that he never got back to later on. I'm not entirely sure what those things are, but he almost sounds a little bit resentful in that passage about that fact. And of course, on the larger scale, World War I extracted a great toll in lives. By the time of the armistice, more than 9 million soldiers lay dead and roughly 37 million wounded. Great Britain, almost 6 million men, a quarter of Britain's adult male population, passed through the ranks of the army, and about one in eight perished. And Tolkien was fortunate in that he survived. Sadly, most of his friends were not, did not survive. And you can feel the pathos of this in the introduction to the Lord of the Rings that he wrote later. when he says, one has indeed personally to come under the shadow of war to feel fully its oppression. But as the years go by, it seems often forgotten that to be caught in youth by 1914 was no less hideous an experience to be evolved in 1939 and the following years. By 1918, all but one of my close friends were dead. And yet, during the war experience, as pointed out by Carpenter in a letter by Tolkien, he later said that, my Sam Gamgee is indeed a reflection of the English soldier, the privates and batmen I knew in the 1914 war, and recognized as so superior to myself. And so without World War I, we might never have had a Sam Gamgee even. There's also another part of this atmosphere that would have colored Tolkien's perspective. Um, the Official Secrets Act, originating in 1889, was brought to the fore during World War I. This is where neighbors were encouraged to report on their neighbors the beginning of the modern surveillance society. Um, looking out for disloyalty. And another factor too is that with both of the world wars and the Great Depression, of which Great Britain was all involved, um, government only continued to expand and expand. World's major democracies drastically expanded the size and scope of their governments in response to all of this. Totalitarianism with its regimentation of society represented an even more extreme form of institutionalization. And so later when Tolkien says that he is an anarchist or a monarchist, this I think has a lot to do why, because he saw what large government could do and was becoming, and how it could interfere in the lives of the ordinary person. Another thing to keep in mind that is that um, in Tolkien's letters, he seems rather set in his views by around 1940 when the Second World War was breaking out. But if that is the case, you also have to keep in mind, World War II was a war that was never supposed to be fought. World War I was supposed to be the war to end all wars. And here he was 30 years later with his own sons being forced into war. However, Tolkien's view of war, as much as it has, may have changed over time, was complicated. On the one hand, he was not a full-blown militarist um, wanting to go, thinking the British Empire could keep expanding, loving the pomp and ceremony of military procession and things like that. On the other hand, he was no pacifist either. Um, as much as he hated World War II, 
and there are some reasons for that. On the other hand, he certainly had some very strong feelings about a certain ruddy ignoramus over in Germany ruining northernness for everyone. In fact, he told, I think it was his son Michael in a letter, that he would be an even better soldier now in World War II than he had been in World War I because he was so mad about that, basically. <laughs> A large part of Tolkien's view on war comes from his Catholic faith. Um, in the Catholic tradition, there is what is known as just war theory. To go over that, uh, to be led by proper authority, to, be, to fight for a just cause with right intentions, must not use illicit means. It must be a last resort, and it must be proportional to the damage originally given. A lot of the problem that Tolkien had with war was because this, you may have been able to fight a war like that, under that description, um, in more ancient times, in the past centuries, but modern warfare is anything but just warfare, according to those dictates, well, most of them. It is more difficult to wage just war because it's so easy for civilian casualties to get caught in the middle. In fact, he says in one of his letters, we were supposed to have reached a stage of civilization which, in which it might still be necessary to execute a criminal, but not to gloat or hand his wife and child by him while the orc crowd hooted. The destruction of Germany, be it 100 times merited, is one of the most appalling world catastrophes. While the first war of the machines seems to be drawing to its final inconclusive chapter, leaving, alas, to everyone the poor. Many bereaved or maimed and millions dead, and the only one thing triumphant, the machines. Interestingly, looking at Lord of the Rings, that is a completely just war. War against Sauron? Well, Sauron attacked first. The Western polities are completely justified in defending themselves as far as that goes. War is legitimately declared by those with the most legitimate power in Middle Earth and the Western nations. Um, and in fact, the war is proportional. Sauron sends orcs and evil men against the West, but you never really hear about any civilians along with them. So civilian casualties among the forces of Mordor would have been minimal. Sadly, the same cannot necessarily be said for the forces of the West with the attacks on Rohan and the siege of Gondor. And yes, this is basically the only choice the West has, is either fight Sauron or else submit to domination, which is really no choice in their view. And so it's interesting that Tolkien has a description of what a just war would like in The Lord of the Rings. And I think Tolkien is was very troubled that such a thing in the modern world with modern warfare could no longer be. Thank you. Either way. Okay. We're going to try this again. <laughs> you know that thing that Corey said where you're brain dissociates and your mouth keeps going, that didn't happen. <laughs> and it was just kind of a blank for a minute. So I'm going to stick a little more closely uh, to my paper and try to be less extemporaneous than I was hoping to be. Um, OK. So speaking about wonder, um, one of the things that was spoken about was the different types of wonder and different types of experiences that can give you those uh, access, that access to that. Um, so one of the things we talked about was the sense of awe and the wonder that's created by things that are 
high, noble, and beautiful, and delightful, and I think even exotic or foreign. Um, and so there is a sense that in Doctor Who that were it not for uh, plot things that there needs to be conflict and danger and you know monsters in each episode that the the natural inclination of the doctor and the companion would be to play tour guide um, and there are several episodes that you know be, before the monster intervenes that begins with um, episodes of him taking the companion to some beautiful locale or an intergalactic festival of some kind that this is what they normally are in search of. It's not necessarily for the dangers and the perils, but for the awesome experiences of seeing something completely new and different. Um, and then as the doctor tells uh, Jackie Tyler that troubles just the bits in between. So in a way, the episodes that we see are the bits in between and what we're not seeing is all the time they spend just traveling in search of a wonderful or awesome experience. Um, and then, so the invitation to travel in the TARDIS inevitably plays on the promise of the wonder because in order to go into the TARDIS with the doctor, you're uh, it, seeking that in some sense, that you're susceptible to that. Um, but one of the key passages early on uh, in the very first episode, Rose, um, gets into this idea that uh, of the fantastic and the mundane playing off each other, that you're taking something ordinary into the fantastic, but you're also recovering, as Tolkien would say, the extraordinary aspects of the mundane um, and the small. So the doctor has this speech to Rose um, where he says, it's like when you were a kid, the first time they tell you the world's turning and you just can't quite believe it because everything looks like it's standing still. I can feel it, the turn of the earth, the ground beneath our feet is spinning a thousand miles an hour and the, and the entire planet is hurtling around the sun at 67,000 miles an hour and I can feel it. We're falling through space, you and me, clinging to the skin of this tiny little world and if we let go, that's who I am. And then he tells her, now forget me, which is, of course, impossible at that point. Um, but what stands out about the passage is that there's not really anything fantastic in that. All he's describing is the earth and gravity and things that exist in our own world. And yet he makes it uh, sound like the most impossible, fantastic, wonderful thing that you've ever heard. Um, so that idea of falling through space and that the mere proximity to him gives you that wonder. That seeing, you know, like we were saying, wonders in the eye of the beholder, that seeing something through his eyes makes, you know, simply standing on the earth a wonderful event. Um, but likewise, having a companion with him gives him that wonder. Um, you know, there's a later passage where he say, talks about how if uh, things look familiar to him, you know, stars that burn for years, but if, if I take you with me and you see it, then I see it new. Um, and getting into that idea of a communal experience between the characters. Um, and so with Rose as sort of the prototypical first companion of the new series, um, it's really about opening up her world to something larger than what she'd experienced. Um, and then the doctor's sort of sales pitch is, you know, you could stay here and fill your life with work and food and sleep, or you could go anywhere. Um, and so, which is called back at the end of her first series when she says, you know, what is life just sitting here eating chips and doing nothing? Um, you know, and so he kind of, you know, evokes the wonder for her, which enables the character growth. Um, to move on to Donna, um, going slightly out of order, um, what's introduced for her in her first uh, episode is this um, slightly different uh, aspect of awe that I don't know if anybody's mentioned yet this idea of the numinous, um, that it can be something sublime, something grand that you can't understand and that even has a fearful quality to it, that it can be um, something that terrifies you as well as gives you wonder um, and you know for circumstances of the story 
really the first trip that uh, Donna goes on is to see the creation of the universe, um, which initially scares her off, right? Like she doesn't become the companion right away. She calls it terrible. It makes her feel tiny. And for the time being, she has to sort of step back and run the, the other direction before she's capable of, um, you know, signing up and realizing what she's missing out by not doing the traveling. Um, I'm not uh, having too much time left, so I'll, you know, find a way to um, wrap this up a little bit. Um, go to the, sure. Um, I hear your final thoughts. Final thoughts. Um, well, uh, it, it's hard to summarize, and I think my issue here was having lots of ideas and, and not necessarily a, a good way to streamline them down. Um, so I'd be happy to talk with people further about uh, other conclusions. Um, but you know, to summarize, that for me, if any of you haven't uh, given this story a chance. Um, all of these things that we've been discussing at the conference this last couple days, um, my argument would be that Doctor Who is one of the really um, good examples of a story that evokes wonder um, and gives you that experience that, you know, lots of kids have grown up on this story, you know, and so hearing how many people found wonder in their lives by having the stories read to them as children by parents, um, you know, there are generations that have testified to that fact with this story. So it's one of the best examples that I can think of uh, in modern storytelling to get at those ideas. If you really want to hear Kat's thoughts on Doctor Who, there's like 400 hours worth of podcasting. <laughs> um, some of those are my thoughts, That's too. probably but, my problem. But, but it's not, not as many. <laughs> right. Um, <laughs> all right. So, um, I, and actually, I apologize for it, because I never actually gave you the full title of my thing, which I didn't, uh, my thing, my thesis. This is what I'm doing. Um, <laughs> Which I only gave to Sparrow like a couple days ago when she asked for it. Um, so the full title is Praxeology and Literature, The Intersection of Action and Imagination. Um, and so in saying that, I kind of wanted to, to say it that way because this weekend um, several people have asked what my thesis was on and every time I stated it, same exact question came out of everyone's mouth, what is praxeology? Um, which is understandable because it's kind of a niche thing and it's from economics, so you don't really expect literature people to necessarily know it. And that was kind of the fascination for me. Um, so I'm just gonna kind of, I mean, I'm not gonna focus on one section. I feel like I do need to give more of an overview and I'll try to go quickly, but it'll be more to like touch points in each section of my thesis. Um, so feel free to, to come and ask me more questions or if we have time afterwards. Um, the, the, the brief definition of praxeology comes from the Greek praxis for action, human action, um, is that uh, it's purposeful behavior. Um, and sort of the, the primary tome, uh, if you want to call it, um, was written by Ludwig von Mises in the 1940s. Um, in English, he actually wrote a German version of his ideas first, and then uh, World War II happened, he came to America, and he rewrote like everything in English. Um, which is kind of impressive in its own right. But, uh, you know, uh, praxeology is the study of human action uh, and, and specifically purposeful action. Um, and you sort of contrast that with, you know, unconscious behavior and staying bodily function, that sort of thing, of course. You can control that to some extent, but, he, you know, he's really talking about that specifically purposeful action um, that is human behavior. Um, and this is an idea that I had been introduced to years ago, um, used to work at a bank, was interested in economics and politics, and, and kind of was introduced it, into it that way. Um, but the thing that really sort of intrigued me about it from a literature perspective wasn't until I started with Mythgard, um, and in the second class that I took, which was the first instance of Corey's Lewis and Tolkien class, where we read an experiment in criticism uh, by Lewis. and. Um, if you remember his experiment, it's basically something along the lines of instead of judging readers by what books they read, you know, oh, you read 
this book or that book, you're either good or bad because you read those books. Um, let's look at how people read. Are they reading with a literary mindset? And if so, what are they pulling from those books? And it just sort of occurred to me, like, that's a really, you know, that's an action-based idea. Um, it, it fits along with some of the ideas that Mises draws on in his thousand-page tome on human action, which is very, fortunately, I only had to read, like, 150 pages, because that's where he, like, defines it. And then, like, all the rest is economics, and I could just, like, ignore that part. But um, so, it, it really intrigued me because I like that approach. Now, I don't like how Lewis actually does the approach. I like the theory behind it, um, but he goes on to give a lot of loaded terms like literary and unliterary, bad and good literature. Um, and I wanted to sort of like look at it more broadly. Like maybe there are things we read that, okay, it might not be literary, but is there, is non literary reading really a bad thing if you're engaging with it? Like, someone's getting value out of that by reading those things. And it could be other types of fiction maybe we don't think of as literary, Twilight or something like that maybe, I don't know. I can pick on that because I did actually nominate it as promised for the Myth Card Academy. I didn't vote for it and I didn't expect it to win, but I did nominate it. Um, so, <laughs> but I do think like, you know, I, I think obviously a lot of us most of us, all of us, study science fiction and fantasy, and we know that in the academic community, it's not always looked on as, you know, literary or whatever. And of course, that's some of what Lewis himself was objecting to. Um, but then you can't just take that and, and apply it to like other things and say, well, that's not literary and, and this whatever. So even if you're doing a non-literary reading, what's the value in that? What, you know, is there some value there? So that was sort of my initial thought, like, oh, there might be something here between this whole action thing um, and and literature. Let me look deeper into it. And so um, I found a really great advisor um, at the University of Virginia, uh, Paul Cantor, who was kind of the only one who has really worked on this like ever before um, with a couple other people. Um, there, there's like one book out there. And um, they, of course, did the economic approach of, you know, oh, let's look at these literary texts and like apply economics to it. And it's like, no, 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 I don't want to do that. Like, I want to see what else we can sort of glean from there. Um, but he pointed me to um, a translation of Aristotle's Poetics that really uh, kind of made my day because it, it really took that literary approach. Um, so the, the translation is by Seth uh, Bernadetti. It's Tom here, did I say that right? Um, and uh, Michael Davis. And the, the thing that really struck me was um, Davis's introduction there, where he says, uh, so with poetics, of course, everyone talks about mimesis, right? The imitation of action. But Aristotle actually talks a lot about action itself, not just like imitation as, you know, theater or literature or whatever. Um, and so Davis says, uh, Insofar as all human action is always already an imitation of action, it is in its very nature poetic. It is the distinctive feature of human action that whenever we choose what to do, we imagine an action for ourselves as though we were inspecting it from the outside. Um, and so there's this imagination, imaginative step that takes place, and, and we can call it imitation, but the imitation itself is an action, right? And so, um, you know, just kind of going along there, he says, uh, he makes this argument that in the context of on poetics, Aristotle invites us to consider um, the different words that he uses. Except, okay, so I don't know Greek, I haven't studied it, Signum hasn't offered it yet, so I blame them. But, um, uh, you know, so he kind of goes through the different, so there's different, you know, words related. So to, to poien, which is the poetics, right, and uh, pertain, and of course praxis. Um, are all sort of related in different ways to the idea of uh, human action. Um, and he says, in the context of on poetics, Aristotle invites us to consider poian and pertain synonym, synonyms. Should we accept his invitation, we would have to translate the title of Aristotle's most frequently read book. Um, that would mean on the art of action, not just imitative action, right? So it's it's that idea of that in, in literature itself, like from the very earliest, uh, uh, literary theory, you know, we've got this idea that there's action at the central core, and I'm like, oh, that's really cool, that's what I want to talk about. Um, which is really nice, because if you didn't say that, then I wouldn't have anything to talk about. Um, 
So I went back to, like this is, so all of, all of this is kind of like, uh, you know, happening. So I'm like, okay, well, I actually need to go back now and read Human Action and, and see what Misa says. And what's really interesting is that, um, in addition to defining praxeology and whatever as a study of action, he kind of comes up with three, he calls them prerequisites. I, I think I call them more like corollaries to action. Um, and basically, there's, there's these three things that people do when they're looking to act purposely, right? Uh, one is you want to change something about the way things are, right? There's uh, you know, some situation or, or something you want to improve or, or at least make not as bad. Um, there's also an imaginative component in that you have to imagine what it is that will make that improvement, right? What, what's going to improve your state of affairs? Um, and then an actual belief that doing something is going to improve that. Um, and I really kind of set my hooks in that middle one, right? That imaginative component, because I, I really think that's uh, really interesting to think that at the core of, of everything we do, there's this imaginative component, right? I can, I'm thirsty, so I can imagine that taking a drink of water is gonna help quench that thirst. I know that from past experience, of course, and then I go and do it, right? I mean, you don't go through all those steps every time you think of it, maybe, but it's, it's really quick, it's really in there. And so I, I really kind of set my hooks in that imaginative core of what human action is. And I started looking around and reading around um, a bit, um, and I really liked, um, so there's a, a, a book out there by Russell Berman called uh, Fiction Sets You Free. And he goes into um, a, a lot of argument back and, and talking about story and the development of language and literature and all of this. Um, and, and he really uh, kind of pulled all this together for me uh, in a way. Uh, so he says, uh, basically, you know, language develops out of this imaginative component as well. You know. It's fundamentally imaginative to use the symbols that we use in language, you know, to represent things um, that we talk about, and and that's a very like that's the core of what we are as humans is, is this imaginative component. And he says, um, language and then literature therefore became that field of society dedicated to the cultivation of the imagination, and therefore also imaginative individuals. Uh, it's that form of subjectivity that has always allowed humanity to aspire for other and better ways of life. Which again, going back to that idea of Christology, it's that desire to have something better, uh, to improve what you're doing. Um, so uh, uh, Berman goes on to say, the capacity to imagine counterfactual and qualitatively new contents suggests the possibility of attempting to realize them, and therefore also the purpose of purposive action. Imagination and teleology are intertwined in, <clears throat> in their common embeddedness in the linguistic and literary condition. Uh, he goes on to talk about counterfactuals and, and that precondition of, of making choices in, in the idea that we have this, you're basically creating this idea of like, what's, what's a new world that I could live in if only I do this thing, right? Whatever that is, and that could be taking a drink of water, could be creating a new university. You know, like that type of thing. Um, so, what, uh, where I kind of went from there is, is really trying to figure out, okay, like this is all great, but this is all really theoretical and, and all of this, um, which means I didn't, I didn't stop looking at the theory stuff. I went on to read some philosophical stuff about, you know, possible worlds and, and all of these, like, um, you know, philosophical stuff. But really what it came down to is, um, I, so last night I um, had the privilege of, of talking with Dr. Drought and, and some other folks, um, you know, about a bunch of different things. And one of the things that he said is, um, I admitted that Kat and I used his concept of the epistemic regime in our podcast talk. And, and Drought was like, wait, 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 no, look, that's just a word I use sometimes. Like, don't use that. But I'm like, but no, that's okay, because I can make up words now too, right? Or phrases that I can use. If you do it, I can do it, right? So the, the thing that I came up with is, with is um, what I call subjunctive worlds. And it's these worlds that uh, could, should, would be, might be, all of that. Um, and it's, it's sort of beyond the idea of just, I think, the subcreative worlds, which are specifically literary, I think, and, and drawn in. But this idea that when we're thinking about the actions we want to take, the things we want to do in the world, we're creating these subjunctive worlds, things that could happen. Now, I mean, some of them might be more possible than others, of course, um, but you can't, you know, you can't really do anything without, like, sort of imagining first what 
an outcome could be. Now, it's not always successful. It doesn't always work out the way you want, but you still have that imaginative component that is part of the prompt of, of doing that. Um, and so I kind of already talked about my relation to Lewis there and um, you know how I would open up that too, but, but I do think there is a strong component of Tolkien in that as well with the on very stories. Um, and one of the things that really uh, really I liked uh, and was able to draw on from Tolkien. Um, so he had this really great uh, phrase in On Fairy Stories um, that kind of tied together the, the language and literature stuff that, that Berman talked about, um, where he says, uh, in this respect, uh, the incarnate mind, the tongue, and the tail are all in our world co -eval. And it's just that idea of, of the mind, the things we think about, the things we imagine, uh, the tongue, the things we say, the language, right? And, and, and the tale in our world. It's not just the tale in our heads, the, the things that we speak. It's the, the things, the way that it affects the world around us that, that really drew that all together. Um, and elsewhere in Not Fairy Stories, he, he goes on and, and describes that sub-creative art as the magic of fairy is not an end in itself. Its virtue is in its operations, and among these are the satisfaction of certain primordial human desires. And so, like, there it is. There's the desire, right? We have the desire. We have the imagination. And then what do we do with that? We have the, uh, you know, ability to then to go out and, and use these. And, and kind of how I've been thinking about it now is that literature is this feedback loop, right? It, it gives us this exercise, if you will, to broaden the way that we imagine things, which then goes out and lets us imagine ways that we can interact with the world in a very real way. I also think that there's an element of, of realization that I don't have time to get into. Um, with just the secondary world and, and, and imagining itself, just living in that secondary world for a bit. Um, but I really like that idea of the feedback loop and, and the idea that literature can be that thing that expands how we imagine what we imagine and gives us that opportunity to then go out and, and expand the ways that we act in the world and, and think about bigger things and think about you know the wonderful things we can do. So that's all I have time for. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. What a varied panel, and yet some really important overarching themes among them, right? I'm going to start out with one question, and then I will see what questions you have. Um, Curtis, I think we already got this from your talk. I was going to ask each of you, what's something new that you've added to the scholarly conversation in your field? And, and from you, I think we heard that really praxeology hasn't been applied to literature before, or very minimally. Yeah, so minimally. So you want to yeah, say yeah. a little bit about that, and then if each of you sure. want a couple sentences about what's, what's in the conversation now that wasn't before. Right, so again, um, the only thing that I'm aware of, um, and that my advisor was aware of, and he's aware of way more than I am, um, is, is the, basically the book that my advisor co-edited on um, sort of economics and literature and, and the praxeological component there. But yeah, so my, my goal here was just to kind of kick open the door and, and see what's behind it, but I, haven't, I don't even feel like I've stepped through yet. I feel like there's a lot more to be done kind of to making those connections and then um, so one real quick thing like I, I really wanted to get into um, how does this affect analysis of like character action within the story um, and I tried my hand at doing something like that for um, Faulkner's As I Lay Dying which I thought was sufficiently imaginative right it takes place in a fictional county there's a corpse that gives her thoughts and um, I figured that falls under speculative fiction right um, but like it, it I just couldn't get it to work kind of in the amount of time and, and word count that I had, so um, I ended up taking that out. But those would be the types of things I would want to continue to pursue and, and go through that door. Great. In my case, doing my searching and my reading, I found a decent number of works on Tolkien and war. Um, I even found a few that talked either about Tolkien's politics or about the political systems in his Legendarium, but I found nothing specifically about his political theory. So my paper, I think, goes behind um, issues of war and power, goes behind his political stances and tries to 
take a look at his political theory. And I connected that also um, in view of his lifetime and the events that he experienced and how they may have affected him. Because they clearly did affect him. And he even admitted as much, even if he is against allegory and likes applicability. Thank you. Um, so I think for me, it's taking the fairy tale elements and applying them at a larger, more structural level. That there were um, lots of references to things of, you know, an article specifically on, um, you know, so and so's use of. Uh, nursery rhymes or how it works in uh, as parallels to Peter Pan or you know taking certain things for granted like well of course uh, there's portals and it's rabbit holes and you know references to these things but nobody really took it further than that and it seemed to be saying that you're a fairy tale if you have a reference to the big bad wolf um, and so um, that's certainly part of it um, but I think what I wanted to see was could you, how far could you take that to its logical extension and could you show that something not just references a genre but actually works in the genre, in the structural tradition of how it's um, been told and how it's evolved and taking those references at a higher and deeper level. Um, for myself, um and I didn't, <clears throat> excuse me, I didn't really get a chance to get into it in this because I, I didn't focus on this part of it for my talk. Um, but uh, I made a big distinction, big distinction between uh, fantasy literature of the past, which had been just a little, like beginning of the 1900s, and then Tolkien, and then uh, how the past really 20 to 30 years is what I categorize as modern fantasy literature, and um, Tolkien and Lewis, and then. Right around the 70s, the 60s or 70s is when this this transition starts to be away from uh, heroes being personified as like oh the ultimate, and now heroes are being people that, like like us. Like we want to be seeing ourselves as the hero. We want to be able to identify with the hero because um, when you have a protagonist in literature, uh, specifically fantasy literature, you're supposed to be able to put yourself into their shoes um, and. I don't know if all of us can do that with Aragorn. We can't do that with things like that. You know, we can do it with Gollum because we're like, we're much more like that. Or maybe, yeah, yeah. Uh, um, but and there was one there was one thing that I came across uh, a quote from Le Guin that I thought was very interesting because I didn't agree with it at all. And she said something along the lines of, "A character is not going to be someone who says something in a negative way." And I can, it's not I, I can find the exact quote for you, but um, and I'm like, no. No, heroes, are you not, the heroes of today aren't doing that. Heroes are very negative. Point to cold water from the magicians. Very negative person, battle suppression, all these things. And basically what Le Guin's saying, she's right on the edge of where um, heroes are embodying um, what we would call that moral ideals. So right now we're kind of off of that. We're trying to make, not necessarily make characters, like I said, more evil, but we want them to be more tarnished, more flawed, easier to relate to because when we read uh, literature, we want to be, we want to take that journey with them. We don't want to just get to that end goal. Um, I don't know if that answered any question or if I made any yeah. sense of that. Thank you. Yeah. Appreciate it. Okay, do we have any questions? And just a reminder if you can just keep it a short question so a lot of people can ask them if you have a longer discussion to have with someone to do that another time. Yeah. Which of the doctors do you think best would be an example of exemplifying fairy tale nature? <laughs> In your opinion. In my opinion. That's a really um, easy question. Well, I, I think that for all of the aspects, whether you're talking about different doctors or different companions or different writers, it is a matter of emphasis. And what I was kind of pleased by, because I was kind of hoping that I would feel this way, was that. They all do it to some extent, but maybe there are certain motifs or traditions that get dialed up or down depending on who's involved. So, um, I mean, I think the uh, the most obvious answer that springs to mind is Matt Smith. Um, but, but again, I think he exemplifies a certain 
childlike quality that seems very sort of whimsical, which is maybe the most obvious way to do the fairy tale genre, that he's kind of, you know, uh, epitomizes this notion of um, embracing your second childhood in a way and, and not caring about seeming grown up or seeming frivolous or silly. Um, but then I think different uh, different ones do it different ways. I think the, the Tenant Doctor is written um, with kind of certain seductive qualities that, you know, make it more interesting when you're having companions sort of, you know, seduced or tempted into the perilous realm. And so that maybe makes it work in some ways. And, um, you know, Eccleston's Doctor, I think, plays with the kind of normalness of something that seems kind of minimalist and ordinary, but has these sort of hidden depths and everything. So it sort of depends on which aspect you're talking about. Um, that would be my answer. Great, Great thank answer. you. The question. There. Uh, the question is for Kat, but I want to confirm first that I understood something Dan said. Are you saying approximately mid-70s Dan is when you see the morally upright, Jinli hero transform into the broken, or perhaps flawed hero, or ignoring the Greek tragic, is that about the right Yeah, time? I would say, like, after, after Tolkien and Le Guin, and then to up till now is when we're kind of seeing that. So the question for Pat is, <laughs> does the succession of doctors, uh, William Hartnell, flawless, right? Does the succession of doctors map onto the timeline that Dan has just proposed. Are they flawed after the 70s? And where's Tom Baker? Sure. Um, I am not prepared for this at all because the thesis was specifically about the new series. But that. But speaking off the top of my head, um, some people other than me, um, in particular, uh, a blog and book series by um, a scholar named Phil Sandifer has written about extensively about the classic series um, and. One of the things he talks about is um, the, especially after Tom Baker, um, the shift over to Peter Davison as the more flawed, relatable doctor. That every every uh, shift is a pendulum swing away from whatever you did before, um, and that's true if you're talking about writers or companions or doctors or whatever. So you always go too far in one direction, and you have to sort of course correct. This is what they tend to do. Um, so if you've been used to um, a larger than life, seemingly invincible force of nature with like, yes, for a long time with Tom Baker, um, then to bring on uh, what people saw as a very relatable, flawed, human, humble, fallible fifth doctor in Peter Davison. So that might, he's not necessarily an anti-hero in the way of that, but but I think trying to make him more human, and then the pendulum swings the other way, and they want it to be more abrasive and alien again. So I think that probably goes along with the kind of anti-hero vogue of the 70s that was happening. Great, also. Yeah, right. And they were also playing with um, soap opera, or starting to play with soap opera traditions of we'll have more characters, they'll argue all the time, and they'll not, they'll have conflicts, and not just the conflict from the monsters, but up with each other. So, and that, um, at least starting, I, you know, I feel like the new series has sort of figured out some more sophisticated ways of doing that, but it was at least starting to move in that direction. Jack. Did I see your hand? Yes. Uh, Yes. So I, I, I just have a thought for Dan um, to react to, uh, which is, is it possible that the sort of pre-70s hero was um, written as a sort of character that was transcending issues of the human condition, and the post-70s hero is transcending issues of personal failure, and that's kind of where the divide mm -hmm. falls? And, yeah, I, I would agree with that because, like I said, I think that the heroes of the of um, someone was talking about this yesterday. Uh, I can't remember who it was, but like they were talking about Victorian 
literature and things of that nature, and how you can see, um, what was it, this is, I can't remember. But yes, I would say that the heroes of the past, past modern fantasy, or past fantasy literature, were embodiments of a virtue or a moral, and now they're embodiments of reality, real people. And um, so I would say that I would agree with that for sure. Mm -hmm. Did that answer your question? Yeah, I mean, I, I think if you extend the scope out, I bet you would see you know, kind of either an oscillation or a wave as mm -hmm. kind of trends rise and fall. Because if you go back to the <coughs> heroes, you think like Hercules, right? Mm -hmm. He commits atrocities and then that sets him off on the dirt. Mm -hmm. um, Plus, a lot of it also is, and we tend to forget that. Um, that the authors of these things, you know, they're writing for the culture of their time, you know. Um, so what, like I said, what might be considered to us an atrocity might have been something, oh, that's great, you know, kill all the village, whatever. That's great, that's what we uh, embody, um, you know, things like that. Uh, but, um, so yeah, I, I think that there is a, a rise and fall, and it'll probably go back to that at some point, you know, more like original heroes or with Arthur or things like that or whatever predated Tolkien. So yeah. I'm gonna take this off. Oh, it's, it's interesting because um, what Ken had said about this is really to both of you again. What you had said just now about um, this this force of nature hero character versus a more flawed hero immediately made me think of. Um, of Jim Kirk from the original Star Trek. Mm -hmm. If you look at him in the original series, he is that unstoppable force of nature who always finds the way. And then you get to him by the film series, and he's a definitely more interesting character. Like, he, I mean, I like Jim Kirk from the get-go, but he's, he becomes a more interesting character in the films of the 80s because you start to see that kind of human vulnerability about him that just did not exist uh, in the television series. Talking about heroes for our times, Cynthia, does this question tie into Tolkien's politics and war because it gives a very particular kind of hero for his times? Oh yes, definitely. Tolkien, I think, was doing several different things on that level. Item number one, a lot of World War I authors, they were very disenchanted, shall we say, and very negative. And Tolkien did not participate in that. In a way, he was trying to um, resuscitate older ways of viewing things. And he, that was what he was trying to do in The Lord of the Rings, I think. But at the same time, he did introduce this new type of hero, the Hobbit, Bilbo, Frodo, Sam, all of who are a very small stature compared to many of the other characters. They aren't particularly important, and yet, for various reasons, to end up playing a central role, sometimes against their will, and the fate of the whole universe, practically. And so that is a very different type of hero than, say, a Hercules, who was born a demigod and has all of these amazing abilities no one else has. These are ordinary people stepping up to do what they feel is right. And people who pretty much fail to do almost everything they set up to do initially. <laughs> True. But they do learn and improve along the way. Yes, they do. Um, I was just interested in the uh, just war theory you talked about. And I was wondering, um, is that part of the Catholic faith? And how long has that been a part of the Catholic faith? Because just with an idea to did that affect how the Crusades were fought or you know, uh, that would be no. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> not, not well. Yeah, I was like thinking that didn't mesh very well, and I was just wondering about that. Just War Theory was first proposed by St. Augustine, so yes, it has been around for a long time. And no, it might not be a specific tenet of the Catholic faith, but it is a very Catholic idea for that reason. So I, I wanted to talk to Dan about that broken hero. Um, 
so if, if, if a hero is flawed, that presupposes a, um, an understanding about uh, what virtue is. And so the question is this. How much of the change in heroes has come from the conscious decision to make them flawed versus how much of the change has come from the concept of virtue in our society changing? Well, that's a good question. Um, I don't know if I have a good answer, but that's a good question. Um, Make a percentage. <laughs> or, or, or not just changing, or be, uh, becoming thought to be unknowable. You know, to yeah. subject subjectivism. Well, and that depends. It depends on the on the hero and the story and the author and the, all that. But I think a lot of it is because of the cultural um, where virtue lies. I think it's where cult, like where where the virtue of the culture is because. Um, like I mentioned in there, like the actions uh, of a hero could be um, villainous to one culture, well, whereas it could be a what we could we would be called a morally good decision in another culture. There's a 40 meter high scat statue of Genghis Khan in Mongolia. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> exactly. And Joseph Campbell talks about that quite a bit. Um, Corey's not in the room, right? Okay, he is just. Okay. He, yeah. Okay, you're, you're safe. Go on. <laughs> <laughs> I hate <Corey. laughs> um, um, But I, and I think I think today, and Patrick Rothfuss, who I'm a fanboy, um, is, is I think he was surprised by it. He mentioned that he was surprised that so many people identified with Ari being broken, and he was he was like he he wonders how many people are going around today feeling broken and alone. Um, it, we don't recognize it in other people. And there is an extent to which sometimes authors do not put like a point of brokenness like where the character reaches the epitome of, of war, well, I, I'm gonna make a decision now to be hero or villain or good or bad. Um, sometimes they don't put that in the narrative. You have to kind of read into that a little bit. And I think it's, um, I think authors are making decisions now more often than not. If, if you have a chance to read Vicious, it's a book by V.E. Schwab, she like just, totally hits this nail on the head about uh, hero versus villain, it's great. Um, so I think that's a modern thing. I, I think that that is now being more uh, an intentional choice by authors than it was you know, 20 years ago, I think. That it's becoming more of a choice now. I get to ask the last question. Curtis, is there a praxeology for the reader's response? So have there been studies of whether people purposefully take on specific actions as a result of reading more of literature. Um, so the easy answer is probably not. Um, I, I didn't find anything in literature studies that, studies that referred back to praxeology except for Dr. Cantor and Stephen Cox's book, <laughs> like that was really the only thing that I, that I have seen um, that explicitly does that. I do believe, um, just by nature of what reader response is, which is what Lewis is doing, right, in, in experiment of criticism, um, I, I believe that there's probably a lot of ways that those can intersect. Certainly, um, I'm also really interested in the idea of like broadening that idea of literature or maybe story is a better idea and even the definition of reader right so listener watcher like those would all be included too perhaps um, even to the point so I'm you know my day job is is marketing digital marketing writing content for websites and um, I was really fascinated in the talk yesterday on um, big data and storytelling um, because I feel like that's a very interesting way that this type of that, that praxeology could intersect with and, and that idea of action and, and yeah, is there are you trying to drive action? Are you just observing action? Like with marketing you are kind of trying to drive action. So well not kind of, you are trying to drive action. But you know, you're still telling story, you're still tapping into that I think fundamental imaginative aspect that we all have and that we access and use on a daily basis. And so I find all those intersections very interesting, but I don't 
I like so I I would say that there probably is a lot in reader response to get back to your specific question that probably could be adapted or applied or somehow interrelated with it. Um, but I did find like those nuggets. So I didn't just look at Aristotle and Lewis and Tolkien. Like I also looked at Northrop Fry um, and his Anatomy of Criticism. And there's stuff in there, little nuggets. Most of it I really did not enjoy. But like little nuggets where it's like, oh, that could really be you know, a hook to hang on and that kind of thing. So I do think there's little things out there that you can make those connections. Um, but I don't, I don't think there's anything that has been done yet in that respect. Okay, well, let's better do it. Mm -hmm. All right, well, thank you very much to our audience, to our panelists.